Okay, um, we have two surgical papers. I know Joanna was very anxious. I noticed that she wanted this to be the first, but but anyway, let's let's be. Uh, let me see how can I summarize the first one. Transcatheter treatment of tricuspid regurgitation, the CLASP uh, TR study presented by Dr. Adam Greenbaum at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta. Well, we all know about tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, here they say there are 2.4 million people with significant TR here in the United States, and there are only 10,000 that are approached surgically a year with a significant mortality of 9 to 10% and medical therapy is unsatisfactory. Now we come with this uh, Pascal repair system, uh, which is a central spacer. Maybe, Joanna, you can explain. It's very, very interesting. It opens up and closes uh, like an umbrella, and it works inside the, um, and being, um, and being uh, um, again, is a transcatheter approach. This is a prospective single arm multicenter study so it's a, it's a longitudinal study. And the purpose was to evaluate the safety and performance of this device at 30 days and at one year. Uh, this is basically uh, the, the study. There were a um, number of patients, not many actually, if I know 65, yeah, 65 patients, age 77 years as an average, uh, female 55, a New York Heart Association, they had significant problems. Uh, three or four, 70, three or four uh, New York Heart Association class in more than 70% of these patients. Now, the results were pretty good, at least the way they are presented. A procedural success, 88%. Discharge at home, 95%. Length of stay in the hospital, 2.6%. Uh, I am a little bit uh, worried about uh, the composite of... Uh, Adverse events is uh, is uh, in one year is seventeen percent with a seven percent mortality. But these patients, I have to say, are sick, so I don't think we can say that this means a lot. Certainly, randomized studies are going on at these times addressing this issue. Uh, the reduction of the tricuspid regurgitation was significant, um, and um, and also the um, <clears throat> the functional class. So in a way what they are presenting is this new approach with one year follow-up, which appears to do reasonably well, but I like your, your comment, uh, John, about what do you think about uh, this, particular, this particular approach with the Pascal device transcatheter? I think that there's very little to gain by explaining why surgical experience suggests that sticking a spacer in between the leaflets of a large valve and clipping two of them together is unlikely to be effective for a large number of patients. The, the acid test is in the results of the treatment. And when you stratify these patients and present them as torrential, very severe TR, um, the win is not reducing that to just moderately severe TR. This is a manuscript that, like many other in the space, starts off with a large series of patients' survival stratified by the presence of mild, moderate or severe TR. Moderate TR is associated with 50% mortality at five years in the figure at the start of this paper, at the presentation and 80% at 10 years. So the goal is not to achieve moderate TR. The goal is to achieve freedom from TR. And I think in a population of patients that don't have an alternative, it's just medical therapy, sure, this may represent an incremental improvement. Um, but really, I think that the key comparators are either effective surgical therapy done um, well, or a, a more robust device that achieves freedom from TR. They have a trial going on, as you know, the class two trial, we'll see what it shows. Uh, I don't know the details. But, uh, any other comments, Paul? Any I think comment class about two, yeah. class two is against medical therapy again? I mean, it's it, against medical therapy. Yeah. Can thank you, Paul. Yeah, I agree uh, with uh, Joanna. I think you know this is technology out in front of this uh, of the science. You know, we have the technical abilities to do this. But we don't have any reasonable um, reason to think that reducing to moderate tricuspid regurgitation is going to change clinical outcome. 
uh, I think that it's great that we're just at the beginning of uh, the development of these devices and hopefully it will offer some promise. Uh, but um, right now I'm, I'm underwhelmed by what I see. A challenge is indeed. Uh, uh, Beacom, any comments? I'd love to see whether we will have a ventricle RV that is too dilated uh, in the setting of functional TR that this may not be helpful. And I think that's uh, going to be an important question. We have learned um, that magical uh, size of the ventricle as well as the ejection fraction range. So too far gone RV in the setting of functional TR is going to be an important question for us to watch. Thank you. Viviani, final word? I would agree. I, I would just say that I'm humbled by the experience with MR and even functional MR, you know, where the ventricle is obviously critical for outcomes, but uh, I think um, we, we need the data and uh, we need to be optimistic because, you know, this has kind of been a forgotten, forgotten area, uh, the right side. So it's exciting. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me go into the last paper which is about um, the structural bioprosthetic deterioration, surgical versus TAVR. And this is the story. This is the is insights from the core valve US pivotal and surtavis trials presented by Dr. Michael Virdon from the Houston Methodist in Houston. And uh, well, we all know the problem, uh, certainly, Tabor is now being used more and more in younger people. And the question is how these bioprosthetic valves are going to behave in the future. And uh, so they tried to approach this study a little bit with a number of different trials, surgical and non-surgical. Uh, so it, it's, it's somewhat difficult to pull together who was who, because some were trials that were randomized, some were not, but they pull all this together. And basically, the objective was to evaluate five-year incidence outcomes and predictors of hemodynamic structural valve deterioration in patients undergoing supraannular self-expanding TAVI and surgery from the core valve US pivotal and TAVI trials. And um, just going over, over I, I get to escape, to escape the demographics, but just to point out the most important aspects of the paper. Uh, when one looks at the results, uh, certainly it appears that the TAVR approach with the, the core valve is actually doing better in terms of tissue degeneration. At uh, the five years of follow-up uh, was 2.57% uh, uh, in terms of, um, of, the, of the group treated with the with the TAVR versus 4.38% of the group treated with, uh, with surgery. Now, this is a cumulative incidence of um, structural uh, deterioration. I don't want to start going into hemodynamics in details because there's not much time, but certainly when the annulus was smaller, less than 23 millimeters, the difference was 1.39% for the TAVI group versus 5.86% deterioration on the, on the surgical group. When the, when the annular diameter was larger, the difference was 2.48 versus 3.96. And also this appear uh, to be the, um, uh, the, the results are of interest because they, they have a number of risk factors other than the annular size, like for example, obesity and others and body surface. They end up saying that in patients with CVAS at intermediate or high surgical risk, the five-year rate of structural uh, valve degeneration uh, was 4% in one group, 2% in the other. And this difference was very significant. And they go into the risk factors I mentioned, the annular and so forth. I think the problem I have with this study, obviously the question is very important, but the way all the data was pulled together uh, maybe I, 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 it's quite difficult, Joanna. What do you think? I think that we're looking at five-year outcomes in patients with a mean age of 80. And my colleagues are all putting these valves into patients aged 50, 60, and 70. And we still 
despite the fact that trials have recruited patients in this age group for well over five to 10 years do not have 10 year outcome data, which is really what we need to inform patients at the point of deciding what therapy they're going to take for um, a really, really common disease and a really commonly used therapy. Excuse me, the way the study was done, can I ask you, because uh, did you understand, Joanna, there are so many studies and trials, and I don't know how the comparisons were made. So my take home from this was that if you have a balloon expandable TAVA, you are more likely to have structural valve degeneration out at five years than if you have a surgical valve. And if you have a self-expanding TAVA, you're less likely to have structural valve degeneration out at five years than if you have a surgical valve. But the percentage points are tiny. We're talking about maybe three or 4% more patients having structural valve degeneration. But the key thing that you want to know as a patient is am I more likely to be alive at 10 years? Am I more likely to be free from stroke? Am I more likely to need another intervention? Yeah. And we should have this data by now. It's, it's a tragedy that we don't. But I agree, it should be younger patients, longer follow-up. That's really the question. Uh, Beacom? I think the devil is in the details because uh, the deterioration is defined either as a 10 millimeter mercury gradient or 20 or AR, aortic insufficiency. And, and the, the profile of these um, uh, interventions are different uh, inherently and thus can be biased towards um, demonstration of one being better than the other immediately even post-procedure just by this threshold. So um, which threshold biases um, favorably for which intervention uh, will need it to be taken into consideration, especially with their profiles in adjustment. And therefore I'd love to know, um, you know, the individuals who had a mean gradient of 30 and above, or, you know, really hemodynamically abnormal valves, uh, because these thresholds are very minor and I don't know the clinical significance of these. 10 millimeter mercury for me is not really a, uh, maybe um, it is a harbor of, you know, future um, uh, hemodynamic significance, but I, I'd like to know really a clinical deterioration or a de degeneration that is resulting in an adverse clinical outcome. I agree. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I agree. I think it's difficult, you know, when you have these pooled analysis to really make good sense out of this. And uh, I, I think it gives us some insight, uh, but I really think we really need to get down to the, what happens to the ventricle, uh, how the, the structural deterioration of the valves compare on a, and with real measurements uh, that we all accustomed to looking at. Uh, and so I, I just think we need a little more information and we probably need a more detailed look and a fair comparison with um, surgery versus the tabbing. Thank you. Thanks very much. Viviani, last word. Yeah, I mean, I agree. If you think back to these technologies, right, when we first started using them, we were using them in a totally different patient population than we do now. That's not necessarily bad. It just speaks to the just tremendous success, right? But now there are different needs and we need different data to help answer those needs. So obviously, you know, as Dr. Chikway pointed out, the competing risk of mortality in this patient population is very limiting. The different types of valves are, are very limiting. Uh, and then I would also echo something that Dr. Douglas said earlier um, that is very, very important for this patient population. And that is, you know, uh, when you look at who is getting access to TAVR, um, it is not representative of, um, of all of our patients. And so um, I think it's really important to include uh, the, right, the right patient populations in trials um, so that we can see who, who best will benefit. Thank you. Okay, finally, of the eight studies that uh, we discussed, uh, which one would you pick? Uh, Joanna? Great. Definitely the Valor HCM trial. I think that was a well-designed, fascinating um, insight into how to manage a really difficult uh, disease. Okay, Bibiani? Uh, so, you know, I think these were also different, um, but I, I would agree. I think Valor um, is just uh, is super exciting. I would also add the TXA trial because I learned a lot um, by thinking about um, that therapy and, uh, and I'm very interested to follow up a little bit more uh, to understand why we're not using it more, more broadly worldwide. Thank you. Uh, Beacom? I would combine Valor and uh, Explorer uh, uh, 
TXC because they they are complementary to each other. And if I could choose them combined, I would. Okay, Paul. Uh, I'm going to show my bias here. I, I'm interested in lipid lowering and what it does to black. So <laughs> that would be my favorite. Uh, but I am biased. I admit that up front. Okay, so I like the one with imaging. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, it's a pleasure. It was fantastic, and I really appreciate your time and uh, the discussion of eight tiles. There are many others, but we have to go. Uh, we, we have uh, we have to be strict in terms of timing. And we have been a little bit over time, but I think it was a good discussion. I really appreciate very much, and thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.